Why the hell is Mascot Horror so popular? Today, I'm going back to my game theorist background and unpacking the psychology, analytics, and secret genius behind what makes Mascot Horror so successful. Probably one of the most successful newish genres of video games on the market. First of all, what is Mascot Horror? Well, it's actually pretty easy to define. Mascot Horror is a subgenre of, I'm sorry, I'm over enunciating the word horror because of my Midwestern accent makes it sound like another word that I won't say because of the dreaded yellow thingy. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> mascot horror is a subgenre of horror, usually indie horror, that uses mascots, think like Chuck E. Cheese animatronics, Disneyland character suits, to deliver their horrific atmosphere. They take imagery typically associated with happiness and childhood and subvert them by making them creepy. Though in reality, some of them are kind of just creepy already as it was. This video isn't really about what makes mascot horror scary, though why it does is fascinating in its own right, because it relies on childhood nostalgia. Nostalgia, mascot horror actually succeeds in kind of placing you in the shoes of a child. That is to say, it makes you feel like a child again, at least a little bit. This makes you feel more vulnerable and small, which makes your mind more psychologically receptive to fear. It's also very closely tied to both masklophobia and cholerophobia, or a fear of masks and the fear of clowns respectively, and the origins of this fear mixed with the uncanny valley are probably what makes this genre so utterly frightening when it's done right. I mean, at least to me because I am a baby. The earliest game example I could find of this use of horror and mascots is Robbie the Rabbit from Silent Hill 3, but I think everybody knows the big one that basically invented the mascot horror genre. FNAF, or Five Nights at Freddy's as the peasantry calls it. FNAF's success was 100% a mistake, or at least unpredictable. It was a random game made by a random guy who made a ton of other forgettable games and then randomly one clicked with the audience and BOOM! It exploded in popularity. It's a delightfully simple game at its heart, like really simple, and if you want a breakdown of how precisely it works, Tech Rules did an amazing video three years ago going over the precise mechanics of Five Nights at Freddy's. But just because it's simple, that doesn't mean that it's a bad game. It's kind of hard to look back at such an overplayed game and assess it objectively, but the games, at least the early ones, are very good and spooky. And when appraising the genre to figure out why it's so damn popular, it's worth considering. Some of them are actually very good games that are genuinely good horror games. But there's a factor we've yet to take into account, and that is, I think, one of the biggest factors when it comes to what has made mascot horror so freaking huge. YouTube. But before I get into that, let's get into our sponsor for this video, Brilliant.org. I'm gonna be honest with you, I've wanted Brilliant to sponsor me for like actual years, so I'm kind of a little starstruck right now. Brilliant.org is such a good fit for me and the stuff that I make because I'm all about trying to get people to think in new and interesting ways, and hey, what do you know? Brilliant has the exact same mission. Brilliant isn't just another platform filled with boring lessons that tell you learning stuff is about rote memorization. Instead, Brilliant teaches you how to think about math and science in an intuitive way. They do this by training you to develop steady learning habits, not by cramming an overwhelming amount of information into your head, but rather by using a series of advanced, low-pressure problems and examples that anyone can understand, even idiots like me. For example, I'm really, really bad at calculus, like, too bad at calc for the kind of work that I do, and I've been wanting to learn it properly for ages. With their pre-calc course that has dozens of interactive toys and easy-to-understand language, I'm well on my way to finally, finally using calculus and videos properly instead of whatever nightmares I I've been using to calculate Peach's floating capacity. If you want to be smarter than me, which is really easy, you can head on over to brilliant.org slash shoddycast to get started. That link not only tells Brilliant that you came from me, which is a great way to support the channel, but it also gets you 20% off for an entire year. Now, where were we? All right, YouTube. You see, YouTubers and streamers on Twitch are massive vehicles for the success of indie horror games, but why? Well, horror offers something that's very difficult to capture in online content creation, authenticity. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a bit of me playing a horror game I've never played before, Input 6. Oh, this is spooky. I don't like it at all. Okay, bullshit. 
Yeah, I had to nope out of that game so fast. I do not like horror games. I cannot handle it. My poor, my poor heart can barely take it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that all of those reactions in that video were authentically mine. I'm genuinely spooked out by horror games to the degree that I can barely play them sometimes, with a few exceptions. And as a result, what you get when I play a horror game is a constantly stressed out little ADHD gremlin on too much caffeine tentatively jumping at every single damn sound. But the thing is, authenticity is generally what sells on YouTube, or, ra <clears throat> or rather the perception thereof, and authenticity is really difficult to fake. As Sarah McRae put it in the paper, Get Off My Internet's How Anti-Fans Deconstruct Lifestyle Bloggers' Authenticity Work, one way in which authenticity labor becomes obvious to publics is through the use of unoriginal or generic strategies. As emerging genres develop enough to have their own norms, tropes, and dedicated followers who become genre experts, some kinds of posts become so familiar that they appear unoriginal or inauthentic. This means in layman terms, as time goes on, authenticity becomes harder and harder to achieve the longer a content creator, called a micro-celebrity in the academic world, makes content, so any way to make that easier is going to really give them a leg up. This is why horror in general is a staple with so many Let's Players, especially the first generation of Let's Players. Indie horror has been a massive boon to the YouTube scene. Amnesia exploded both both PewDiePie and Markiplier's viewership base, and horror continues to be a staple of Markiplier and Jacksepticeye. And it all boils down to one thing, authenticity. Well, and it's just genuinely entertaining to watch a grown man freak out over a video game. But this touches on why specifically horror has done so well on YouTube and Twitch, and has nothing to do with why mascot horror specifically has done so well. And I think it's hard to deny that it's a very successful genre. So successful, in fact, that it's been flooded with a horde of mediocre or straight up bad titles trying to capitalize on the success of the genre, and I do mean capitalize with a capital C, as in let me get as much money as I possibly can, like Garten of Bonbon bon, literally having a merch button on the title screen. Which does touch on one of the successful components of mascot horror, marketability. But now I don't just mean that they make good merchandising, but the fact that they make good merch actually is the hint that we need to put all the pieces together. This all boils down to something called super normal stimuli, which is the scientific term for exaggerating key features of an object to somehow mimic or encourage certain behaviors. Generally speaking, it's used in terms of attraction. You see, scientists have found that certain birds, like the Eurasian oyster catcher, prefer certain qualities in their eggs and will care for some eggs more than others depending upon these characteristics. Specifically, they preferred larger eggs to smaller eggs, so scientists gave the birds cartoonishly oversized artificial eggs that looked otherwise normal, and these birds abandoned the normal eggs for these experimental ones ones, clamoring on top of them even though they could barely fit in the space. Another good example of super normal stimuli is Jessica Rabbit from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, whose exaggerated features are designed to make us react in a specific way, what's scientifically known as a wooga. Ow, ow, ow. Awoo. <laughs> I couldn't get through that without, <laughs> I tried to do like 16 takes, I just couldn't do it. It's basically why we like cartoons and find them funny or otherwise entertaining. They're simplified, exaggerated versions of things we recognize in real life. And we want to be around these things, and yes, sometimes buy them, like my spouse's giant freaking Gengar stuffed animal. Literally the perfect representation of an impish goblin creature. This is part of what makes these characters frightening, and what makes this such a successful genre. The slightly wrongness of the characters that would veer into the uncanny valley are cranked up to 11 and it's honestly pretty spooky most of the time. But exaggerated features put aside, the fact that almost all mascot horror titles are based in a setting that's aimed at children, like pizza parlors, toy stores, and literal kindergartens, this has made the games marketable and relatable to a wide range of audience ages. Children are interested in these games because it's a comparatively safe space for them to experience horror. It's like telling ghost stories, but in video game form. And adults like these games because, well, they're filled with nostalgia for these places. I went over this a bit when I talked about what makes mascot horror scary earlier. So, yeah, a lot of people from a lot of different places in their lives are likely to be drawn to mascot horror as a result of its widespread appeal. But back to exaggerated features and cartoonish faces. <laughs> cartoonish faces. But back to exaggerated features and cartoonish faces. You know what else those are really, really good for? 
Thumbnails. Super normal stimuli is essentially what makes for a clickable thumbnail, which is the lifeblood of YouTube specifically. It's why I like to put googly eyes in my thumbnails whenever I can. It's not just that I like to put googly eyes on stuff, it's that goofy googly eyes catch your attention. Even if you roll your eyes at them like... I don't know, man. That's what people are clicking on. You can notice this with some other creators on the platform, too. Even if their primary thumbnail is their own face, sometimes the really successful folk will exaggerate their key features, specifically their eyes. I think Gotham Chess is one of my favorite examples of this sort of thing. Just look at this guy. <laughs> But it's this marketability that helped spread these games across both Twitch and YouTube, but more importantly, they inspired fandoms. This was done in a number of ways. The little mysteries in some of the games are a big reason behind their successes. A good example of this is Five Nights at Freddy's, which, yes, a lot of the lore is put in there post hoc, but each installment has left little story puzzles for people to put together off screen. This is basically why you see MatPat covering this game so freaking much. A bad example of of this is Hello Neighbor, which was all mystery and no substance. They focused so much on theory baiting that they dead ass did not make an actual game. You guys forgot the key component! Make an actually fun game! But this is stuff that, again, any good horror game can do. Like, this is essentially what made Alan Wake a successful game, or Silent Hill, or Resident Evil. What is unique about mascot horror that attracts fandoms? Well, the character design. It encourages fans to get attached, to make art, to compose a elaborate animations based on the games, to make fan games themselves, to pick favorite characters to get attached to, I guarantee you that out of every character in FNAF, each one is someone's favorite. And it's this relationship between players and the characters that makes such a big impact on a game's success. In fact, this relationship is key for not just the games themselves, but the people who make content playing them. Because the final key of the puzzle is a culmination of all these factors that leads to the genre's success in the limelight. As for Francesco Tonilo put it in the paper Evolution of the YouTube Personas Related to Survival Horror Games, in general, survival horror and YouTubers can constitute a combination capable of generating good performances even outside the cases of instantaneous and explosive success. The creator of Emily Wants to Play, for example, has publicly acknowledged the contribution made by YouTubers and streamers to the success of his video game. They played a major role in the success of Emily Wants to Play, and it's a win-win situation. YouTubers and online streamers are the core force behind the success of the modern indie horror scene in particular. They broaden the audience base, they foster fandoms, they promote pretty much every game they play just by playing them. And what's more fascinating ultimately is the very same paper talked about how it's not just a one-way relationship. These games actively change the YouTubers who play them by shaping their personas around the games themselves. It's a mutualistic relationship, not a one sided one. Indie horror devs keep YouTubers alive with a steady stream of games to play, react to, and theorize about, and the YouTubers promote said games by just talking about them. It's a match made in heaven. And it might sound like from this video that I'm condemning mascot horror for being a cheap cash grab or something like that, which couldn't be further from the truth. I genuinely believe that many of the Five Nights at Freddy's games are actually quite good, and my favorite game of 2021 was actually a mascot horror game, Happy's Humble Burger Farm, which is a wickedly cool game game with wickedly cool lore if you ever are looking for something to deep dive into. No, I'm not condemning the genre at all, I actually think a lot of it is really really good, but there are quite a few bad games out there and that is largely due to how successful most of the genre has been at generating interest and money. So that is why Mascot Horror is so successful. Through a clever application of super normal stimuli and enhanced authenticity, good Mascot Horror games foster a mutualistic relationship relationship between online content creators and themselves, which in turn exposes the games to more people who then build fandoms through theorizing art and fan games. This, in a way, immortalizes good mascot horror games and creates built-in audience bases with built-in promoters. Mascot horror characters are extremely marketable to a wide variety of age groups, but especially children, and their extreme cartoonish features make extremely good thumbnails, which is the lifeblood of the YouTube community. Both mascot horror games and YouTubers and other streamers benefit from this relationship, which means it is more than likely to continue on for quite a while longer. It's simple, really. And I don't think mascot horror is going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Sincerely, Austin.
Whoa, boy, this video was a lot of work. I, I can't even begin to tell you how long I spent working on this video, but I had a lot of fun putting it together. When all the pieces clicked, oh, oh, that's so satisfying. I just want to throw out a thank you to you for watching, and I want to throw out a thank you to my Patreon patrons who make this show pot, like, literally, lifeblood of the... We want to talk about lifeblood of the YouTube community. Patreon patrons are it. If you want to be a Patreon patron, head on over to patreon.com slash the science or patreon.com slash shoddycast. I've explained in enough videos why I have two Patreons. I'll explain it again in the future, but I'm not doing it today. You can't make me. I have to thank all of those patrons. They are like amazing, but I especially have to thank these fine people who paid me money to say their names. I'm talking about M. Lopez, Fen McFedrick, Justin Bush, Dr. Vem, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, Edadam TP, Art of Fox. Fox, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazer. If you guys are the real ones, and I will see you next time. I love imitating Markiplier. And I will see you another time. He doesn't, does he do that anymore? I don't think he does that anymore. I guess I'll have to watch another Markiplier video to be sure. I'm rambling. Goodbye. Goodbye.